All right. Here we go. So Dr. Nicole Mozer um, is an interdis interdisciplinary programs manager and research scientist at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, or CSING, in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, Dr. Nicole Mozer actively facilitates, empirically investigates, enhances capacities for scientists and scholars who collaborate at the intersection of social and environmental systems to solve complex challenges. Nicole has worked directly with hundreds of graduate students and dozens of early to late career researchers from across disciplines and around the world through first of their kind programs, workshops, and trainings she regularly designs and leads. Nicole particularly enjoys facilitating the collaborative development of research ideas, teaching leadership skills, and helping teams integrate qualitative data and unconventional perspectives into synthesis research. In addition to her extensive support for interdisciplinary research teams, Nicole is an active interdisciplinary researcher and collaborator herself. She, um, sorry, her most recent multi-institutional interdisciplinary collaborations include co-developing an interdisciplinary evaluation framework and methodology, co-creating a networked approach for graduate sustainability leadership training programs across North America, and co-creating an assessment of marine spatial planning initi initiatives worldwide. She additionally co-leads a longitudinal mixed method study aimed at better understanding needs and advancing outcomes for synthesis-based graduate education and research opportunities at institutional and national scales. She also had joined Michigan State University's Center for Interdisciplinarity in the spring of 2019 as a vis visiting fellow and has received additional support for interdisciplinary related work from both NSF and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Nicole joined CSYNC in January of 2016 while completing a doctorate in geographical sciences at the University of Maryland College Park. Nicole's strong interdisciplinary background ranges from assessing the effects of nature-based tourism on poverty and inequality in South Africa, oh sorry, Southern Africa, to investigating how food system regionalization and gender dynamics shape rural development processes in the Rocky Mountain West, and um, surveying trees on Maryland's eastern shore and mapping water quality and invasive species in uh, the Florida Everglades. In her free time, Nicole enjoys gardening, birds, fiction novels, and yoga. Uh, I can totally appreciate those things as well. Um, thank you so much for being here, Nicole, and we're really excited about your um, about your webinar today entitled Adapting and Designing Interdisciplinary Training Programs to Prioritize and Excel Because of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Christine. It's really nice to see so many names that I don't recognize, uh, new connections, as well as some folks that I, I do know. Hi, Bethany. Hi, John. I'm sure there's more of you out there. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, can you, can you all see that? Great. So hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with you today. As Christine said, my name is Nicole Motzer. My pronouns are she and her, and I am Assistant Director for Interdisciplinary Science at SYSINC. There, one of my many jobs is to run our graduate student research program. And today I will be drawing from one of my most recent experiences in this role and talking to you about how to adapt and design interdisciplinary training programs to prioritize and benefit from diversity, equity, and inclusion. To get us there, I will first introduce SYSINC and socio-environmental synthesis for those of you who are unfamiliar. I will talk about how tightly linked science and DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion are, and how these connections helped motivate a new training opportunity for us at SYSINC. Then I will do a deep dive into that opportunity, which we called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Socio-Environmental Synthesis <laughs> Graduate Student Workshop. <laughs> uh, and I will present some results uh, we, we have from an evaluation survey we did of that workshop. 
And I will end on our key lessons learned and the most important steps I think other programs who are interested in similarly adapting their trainings can take. I will have a few pauses for questions throughout. So please feel free to wait for those pauses or to hold your questions until the end. Um, and fair warning, <laughs> I will try my hardest to make it through this hour without having to take a bathroom break and without getting out of breath, but I'm 16 weeks pregnant and apparently babies don't care if you're giving a webinar or not. <laughs> so hopefully this all works out. Okay, so what is Sync? Sync is one of four data synthesis centers across the United States funded by the National Science Foundation. And our explicit mission is to foster synthetic actionable scholarship on the structure, functioning, and sustainability of socio-environmental systems. We do this through a variety of research programs, short courses, seminars, workshops, fellowships, conferences, tailored support services for our research teams, all kinds of things that are part of a living experiment around how to make interdisciplinary science work and how to make it especially work to solve pressing socio and environmental issues. Prior to COVID-19, we hosted about a thousand visitors a year at our facilities in Annapolis, Maryland, which I would also like to honor and recognize as the unceded and traditional homeland of the Piscataway Kanoi Nation. So what do we mean by synthetic scholarship? It's kind of a strange term, right? Is it fake? Is it artificial? What our work revolves around at Sync is the socio-environmental synthesis approach. Socio-environmental synthesis is a data-driven research approach inspired by the fact that no one discipline or skill or method or background can generate answers to the increasingly complex questions we must ask as, as, a, as a world, as scientists, meaning that no one person or group will get us where we need to go. Synthesis leverages the power of diversity to accelerate the production of knowledge, distill and integrate disparate data and theories and thinking, and to expand the realm of scientific possibility and inquiry, especially by pooling traditionally siloed approaches and sources of information. Everyone's favorite program at Sync, of course, is the Graduate Student Research Program, which for the last almost seven years now has provided interdisciplinary skill building workshops for hundreds of graduate students around the world. Uh, even though we're based at University of Maryland College Park, our programs are open to uh, graduate students from any university. And in addition to those skill building workshops, we also provide a genuine interdisciplinary research experiences in the ra range of 18 to 24 months, which we call graduate pursuits. And you can see um, over those seven years that how many workshops and teams we've supported as part of this program. At the core of the grad program at Sync, and in fact, every program at Sync is the fact that social problems are environmental problems and environmental problems are social problems. And these problems are accelerating. But as I'm sure many of you know, why you know, the interreach community exists is a traditional disciplinary training generally does not teach or prepare graduate students for how to do science or think about science in the way that socio-environmental problems are all complex, wicked problems demand. And so we make it a point to teach graduate students how to do things like leverage diverse insights, combine a wide array of skills, resources, and tools, and blend different forms of knowledge, especially those they might not have come across if they stayed in their own field or their own department. As such, diversity in all respects has always been an important part of this program and its goal of preparing graduate students to address complex socio-environmental issues. Each year though, it became more and more apparent to us that we wouldn't be able to do this to the best of our abilities until DEI was not just an important part of what we did, but central to what we do. 
As Dr. Jedida Isler so beautifully put it, the liminal space between disciplines is required to investigate the complex problems that remain unsolved by society. And we cannot get to the best possible outcomes without the bringing together of the liminal, the differently lived, distinctly experienced and disparately impacted. We cannot be the most excellent expression of our collective genius without the full measure of humanity brought to bear. Going back to the notion that we can't tackle the world's most complex socio-environmental problems or answer its most important questions unless we infuse DEI into all that we do. Simply put, diversity and scientific inquiry are inextricably linked every step of the way. And we risk doing a disservice to science and society if we fail to realize and act on this. The first link I wanna mention between science and DEI is the what, who, and for whom we conduct our interdisciplinary research. Whose needs do we prioritize in this process? We can currently see tensions around research priorities playing out in Hawaii with the construction of the 30 meter telescope on the sacred site of Mauna Kea. There, the lure of answering some of astronomy's biggest questions has come into direct conflict with the religious and cultural significance of the mountain. The failure to balance or even consider diverse priorities equitably is causing trauma once again for native Hawaiians while also holding back essential research. No one wins in this type of situation. Next, many of the most prominent problems we face today can be traced back to failures in DEI and worse. Centuries of racism, first in the forms of extractive colonialism and slavery, and now continued with socioeconomic inequalities and environmental injustices are thought to have culminated in the modern climate crisis, for example. If we see the worst disasters and environmental problems as colorblind, we'll blind ourselves to key drivers and solutions of these problems. DEI can also determine how well we understand the world around us with more diverse investigators coming up with more diverse lines of inquiry or more diverse perspectives on a phenomenon. For example, following the rapid growth of women primatologists, the field saw many scientific breakthroughs, including debunking traditional sex-based stereotypes about primate behavior. DEI also shapes how we approach the science we do and with what degree of rigor. Issues to consider in this vein include whose ways of knowing are valid and how reliable scientific recommendations are. In a piece for science titled Flawed Environmental Justice Analysis, Brian Emanuel describes how when it comes to environmental justice, non-rigorous methods applied by majority or you know, non-underrepresented minority researchers can hurt more than help vulnerable populations by masking real, real world impacts. And this could be seen in the case of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which would have disproportionately impacted Native Americans in North Carolina when a government mandated assessment implemented a flawed population survey masking the impacts this community would have felt. Nothing about us without us has long been a response to academics who fail to include diverse real world needs and views into the research process and end up putting forth solutions that are less meaningful and less feasible than they otherwise could have been. And finally, and perhaps most apropos of this audience, DEI plays a significant role in what our research collaborations look like how they function, how we experience them, and what they end up doing in the end. But what I really want to emphasize here is the amazing problem-solving capacities that emerge when DEI is prioritized. Because diverse teams are more likely to do things like remain objective and challenge assumptions and eschew stale ways of thinking, their collective intelligence becomes greater than homogenous groups. 
Over and over again, research is finding that the combination of functional and identity diversity, or what you can do, as well as who you are as a human being, is virtually unbeatable when it comes to innovating and solving tough problems. It's not enough anymore, and really it never was, for people to come together from different disciplines alone. It's a step to better science and a better world, but it's only the first step. Ultimately though, for Sink and I think for everyone, it's not just about improved problem solving or developing better theories. DEI in science has a very human face. Science is not an even playing field, even though some may like to think so. Uh, dropout rates and attrition are far higher when you look at non-majority genders and races and sexual orientations in science. And that is mostly attributable to the continued onslaught that people of these backgrounds and identities face when it comes to things like token stress, the invis invisible extra duties of having to fit in or explain themselves, stereotype threat, me search, which is the idea that people of color or minority researchers only like to research things pertaining to themselves and is somehow looked down upon as not, not objective or not scientific. And things like the systematic and unprofessional biases and ratings and reviews. People who know me know that I am not a fan of peer review and publication as a main indicator of how well someone's doing because it is not objective. Scientists are people and people have biases. Further chilling facts are that innovations by women, people of color, non-binary researchers tend to occur more frequently, but are less recognized, less rewarded, and less taken up than are those by majority researchers. And I highly recommend this paper by Hofstra et al. 2020 in PNAS if you're interested in looking into that more. Faculty diversity in basic science departments, if we continue business as usual, is not expected to increase until 2080, unless we do something significantly different. And underrepresented minority scholars play a disproportionate role in advancing DEI within academia. And all of this is just a snapshot of what I now know underrepresented minority scientists ex experience. We had to think decided that we wanted to do something about this, to be on the front lines of confronting this massive social justice issue, a desire that became even more important with the intersecting tragedies of 2020 for communities of color in this country, between police brutality, between the COVID epidemic affecting communities of color much more. <clears throat> and so with all of that, we decided to try to write a different story or at least to create a pocket in the world for graduate students where their differences were something to be celebrated, uplifted, and appreciated. We wanted our story at Sink to be about the incredible benefits and strengths of coming together and embracing differences rather than fighting against them or sweeping them under the rug. And so we transformed our annual graduate student workshop on socio-environmental synthesis to the diversity, equity, and inclusion in socio-environmental synthesis graduate student workshop. I hope I don't have to say that again. <laughs> so before I go on into my deep dive into the program, are there any questions from anyone about what I have said up to this point? I can't see the chat. So Christine, are we good? Yep, there's just one request from Bethany, um, if you could share your bibliography with us. Sure, yes. Great, thanks. Okay. All right, moving on. So before I go into any specific detail about uh, the DEI and SES workshop, which I will call it from now on, I wanna first give you a quick overview of how our graduate student trainings at Sysync generally work. So starting up in the top left-hand corner 
Our workshops can be standalone skill building opportunities for graduate students, or they can be just the first step in a much longer research process and educational opportunity specifically tailored to the graduate student career stage. So as you'll see when I go through this a little more um, in the next slides, our workshop is skill building, but we also have the goal of graduate students finding collaborators at this workshop as it being a catalyst for collaboration. And our hope is that they leave the workshop with the beginnings of interdisciplinary teams that then propose interdisciplinary research to SUSINC. And you'll see that between the workshop stage and the proposal stage, there's lots of iteration and ideation and help with SUSINC staff on how to uh, develop an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary project and put together an interdisciplinary team. Then once their proposals are submitted for those graduate pursuits, the 18 to 24 month projects I told you about. Then we send them to a full blown external scientific review committee. They get the full experience of what it's like to submit research to a panel of experts and get feedback. After they get the community feedback, they send a response to reviewers incorporating that feedback. And once that's deemed acceptable, we welcome them into the graduate pursuit program where we provide all kinds of support, ranging from mentorship, facilitation, meeting design, which is a lot of my realm, to computational and cyber infrastructure support. And in normal times, uh, we fly teams to our facilities in Annapolis three to four times over their project course for short bursts of really intensive interdisciplinary interaction to try um, and make progress on their interdisciplinary questions. Now we have two cohorts uh, that are doing this virtually at this time. So we've had to make quite a few modifications, but this is the general arc of how things work. Before I go any further, I also wanna give huge thanks and my deepest gratitude to my fellow workshop co-organizers, Drs. Fuchsia Hoover of Sasink. Jorge Ramos of Stanford and Varsha Vijay, formerly of SUSINC, now at Nimbus. And of course, John Kramer, Director for Interdisciplinary Science at SUSINC. They all were hugely instrumental in making this workshop possible. Um, I also want to thank Ecological Society of America's SEEDS program for the important role they played in the initial conceptualization of this workshop. And they were a huge help in recruitment for this workshop as well. So generally speaking, the, our workshop design was to invite 25 graduate students from universities all across North America. And participants came from a wide array of disciplines and backgrounds ranging from biology to anthropology to geography to ecology. You can see from, my, from that previous slide that our organizing committee was equally composed of interdisciplinary experts and DEI experts. So John and I had a lot of conversations around knowing that both of us are white and do not share in many of the same life experiences as our graduate students coming to this workshop would. So having underrepresented minority scientists step in to fulfill the DEI mentorship was hugely instrumental. And I think really gave the, the graduate students what they needed, what we could not have personally provided for them. The workshop was originally scheduled as a four day workshop in March of 2020. <laughs> and two weeks before everyone was supposed to travel to Annapolis for our workshop, we got shut down due to COVID-19, as did many other things uh, in this year. And so we, trans we decided to transition the workshop to an eight week summer series starting in July. And that was all online. And the reason it took us a little while from March to July to decide to do this was because the in-person workshop is so interactive. It, there's so many 
activities and pairs and teams. And in fact, the last two days, the majority of it is students just working on their own, developing their interdisciplinary projects in teams. A big component of the workshop is the social aspect, which I'm sure you all know is so important to interdisciplinary collaboration, where they would go out at night and walk around downtown Annapolis. But we ultimately decided that the we didn't want to focus on what we couldn't have if it was virtual. We wanted to focus on what we could do. And so we just tried to make our sessions as interactive as possible with lots of lots of breakout sessions and things like social happy hours or weekly office hours where they could check in with each of the mentors if they missed a session or they had questions or they just wanted some personalized mentorship. And then we also had extra extracurricular DEI focused forums that our, our diversity mentors led around things like um, more professional development questions or questions around diversity in their own departments that were not core to the workshops curricula. And essentially what we were trying to do with all of this was to not only create that community building that is so important to the in-person workshop, but to really equally balance connections and content. And all of this played out over Zoom, a combination of Zoom, Slack, and Google Drive. So our weekly sessions would be on Zoom, and then we would invite continued discussion or um, any homework discussion or any pre-session discussion on Slack. So there was lots of opportunities to keep the communication going. So as I mentioned, our weekly sessions were two hours over Zoom and they covered topics including socio-environmental synthesis and systems thinking for a DEIJ perspective, DEIJ and the synthesis research process, advancing DEIJ with actionable science, enhancing SE synthesis capacities to promote DEIJ, fostering innovation with DEIJ and igniting interdisciplinary collaborations, communicating SE synthesis research. And then um, you'll see that this is all a trajectory from what are the skills that individuals need to engage or become familiar with interdisciplinary research? And then how can we transition from an individual focused workshop to one that ultimately ends in collaborative teams with the hope that these teams propose interdisciplinary research. And so our final session was a, a panel of former Grad Pursuit alumni to talk about their experience and what they learned and any advice they had. And also we asked the students to pitch their interdisciplinary projects to an informal panel of all of the workshop organizers and mentors as a way to get real-time feedback before they formally submit their proposals to SYSINC. A guiding premise for this was that we wanted to not only prioritize DEI in what we taught, but in how we taught it and how the students learned it. So for example, one of our first orders of business as a group was to co-develop a rules of engagement, participation agreement, code of conduct, whatever you wanna call it. But we asked the students what they felt was most important to feel respected, to feel um, safe, to feel heard and understood and what, how they wanted to be treated, how they wanted to treat others. And so we all agreed to that. And then we upheld those rules of engagement for the group. And I think um, it was a wonderful group. So there was no need to really enforce this type of thing, but I think it was a really great lesson um, to teach the students and, and a good example that um, it's not just what you're talking about, but it's how you're all talking about it and, and how you're engaging with it. We also invited co-production in other ways as well. So we looked at all of their applications and what they were most excited to learn or most interested in learning. And we really use that to develop our curricula because we wanted them to get the most out of this opportunity as we could give them. And we also, um, for example, added another week. It was originally a seven week series. We made it an eight week series 
after we heard from the students that they wanted some more time to develop their interdisciplinary research projects. So it was very much a, a collaborative effort in developing this, this experimental online journey. We also did thing like, things like model inclusive language and behavior. And it was really important to me that we set the example for this so others didn't have to or didn't feel like they had to take the burden of introducing this to the group. So, you know, you might have heard that I included my pronouns when I first started this, or I did the tribal land acknowledgement, or in my Zoom name or my Slack name. I always have my pronouns, and we encourage students to have anything they wanted to about, about themselves uh, in, in these types of platforms. So name pronunciation is another thing when you're dealing with really diverse um, students and backgrounds, you know, it's, it can get really tiring to have to keep correcting how people pronounce your name. So that was really important to us that we make that a central feature of the workshop. And then we also made space for hard conversations and, and current events. And this is also where the DEI mentors came in really, um, were really helpful in this. <clears throat> One second. So for example, um, one of the weeks was a day after the shooting of Jacob Black in Wisconsin, shot multiple times, Black man shot multiple times in the back. And so we opened that with some reflection on it and how some of the, the Black students might have been feeling or just people of color might have been feeling. So we really didn't stray from these challenging topics that it's honestly tempting to not talk about them if you don't know what to say, you don't know how to approach it. But I think the students felt really heard and seen and that they could be really transparent and honest with us and that we cared enough about them to make, make space and time to talk about those types of things. Also in line with the DEI, not only what we, we taught, but how we do it, um, we designed all of our examples and activities to be DEI relevant. So for example, um, in the first week when we talk about SE systems and SE synthesis, we use this uh, a community in Mexico that's struggling with the depletion of their fish populations as well as the um, incursion of the drug cartels and how it's really tearing the community apart and shifting the economics of the community and the environmental landscape of the community. So um, we had students use, use that situation to practice building a socio-environmental system and identifying the diverse actors and identifying the interactions between the system components that might be mediated by issues of justice and equity and where are the intervention points. We also featured the work of underrepresented minority scholars as much as possible and created a, a variety of formal and informal engagement opportunities. And important to note at different times of day, recognizing that diverse people have diverse responsibilities and diverse needs. And we had students who were parents and so had to balance childcare um, or just had different things that they were all juggling. And so the formal and informal engagement was a really great way for people to not only pick and choose what could work for them, um, but to also just create a variety of, of ways that match different ways of learning, different ways of communicating, different ways of interacting. So if a student wasn't comfortable bringing something to the fore amongst a group of 25 or 30 people, maybe they wanted to more informally bring up a subject at one of the social happy hours or at one of the Zoom office hours. And we also notably decided not to record sessions. And this was because we did not want anyone to feel that they had to self-censor as part of our workshops. We did not care or ask about citizenship status. We did not want people to feel that they had to curb what they wanted to say or what they wanted to share about themselves. And we also know that it's just, it can be a really vulnerable thing to talk about some experiences that you might have found traumatizing or that are just really sensitive. 
And so we, we did not want that to be out in the world if the students weren't okay with it. But we did make all session materials available online. So any students who weren't able to make a week or anyone who wanted to revisit materials, those were all available for them. So how did we do with all of this? A few results here. We asked them as a result of participating in the workshop, how much do you agree with the following statements? And we had a pretty good response. So to the question of, do you have a better understanding of how to address complex socio-environmental problems? We had um, about 85% agreed or strongly agreed to that prompt. 100% agreed or strongly agreed that they feel more prepared to engage in interdisciplinary research collaboration following the workshop. And we have some supporting quotes for some of these results. So the grad pursuit project I'm currently involved with is exciting and gets to explore a topic that parallels my dissertation work that incorporates interdisciplinary collaboration and explores a facet of the topic I probably otherwise wouldn't dig into. I see this as an opportunity to develop as a researcher and collaborator. We also had prompts talking about more focused on DEI. So you are better equipped to, with knowledge and skills to promote DEI in science. 100% agreed or strongly agreed with that. As well as agreed or strongly agreed with the fact that they received mentorship, guidance, or instruction on DEI that they otherwise would not have. And again, that goes back to our mandate almost of supplementing the gaps that many students experience that they tell us they experience in their home institutions. And then important to us was that 100% agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, you belong to a new highly diverse community of early career scholars. And the reason this was so important to us is because we know from talking to students, we know from the literature, that being an underrepresented minority in science can be a very isolating experience. And especially with COVID-19 and not being able to interact with peers or your lab mates or your department, we wanted the students to feel like they did have a, a strong community and, and strong connections, even if they were virtual and spread across the country, that there was still this group that they could share with, commiserate with, connect with. What I found most valuable was getting the time to talk in less structured ways with mentors and other students. So supporting the importance of that community building and socializing aspect. And then was adapting the workshop to a virtual environment worthwhile? Uh, the majority strongly agreed or agreed with that. And then we had some you know, ambivalent responses, but at least there were no disagreements on that question. And then your own dissertation research will benefit from what you learned. The vast majority strongly agreed to that statement. And then asking about ratings of different types of things, uh, the vast majority deemed that the topics covered and the content presented were excellent or very good. Topical activities, mostly very good or excellent. Some supporting quotes. For me, some of the topics came at opportune times where I could easily apply the lessons to real life. I think the overviews of different theoretical frameworks for SES work was particularly valuable for me because that's the kind of material that is not often taught in academic programs since it doesn't quite fit into any specific departmental category. Again, that goes back to those liminal spaces and where SUSINC really tries to fit in. We don't belong to anyone department or field. And so we try to be the glue that can stitch all of these disciplines and fields together. Interactions with mentors were rated as very good and excellent. And for those of you wondering about technological platforms to use in a virtual environment, the vast majority felt that the, the combination of Zoom, Slack, and Google Drive was excellent or very good, or at least satisfactory. All of the workshop mentors are amazing and I felt connected to each of them in different ways. 
I really appreciated learning about their different journeys. It was affirming to see all of their success and unique pathways to where they are now. The openness with which they welcomed us in the workshops, office hours was motivating. And then this one, this might be the first time I've experienced mentorship from a place of deep respect and caring first and intellectual guidance second. It completely changed the dynamic and made the whole experience brighter, lighter, and better. And then another just more logistical thing for those of you who might be thinking about a, a series, uh, the vast majority felt that the two hours was very good and or excellent. And I'll note that we took a 10 minute break within those two hours, which the students told us was re really essential. And then the duration of the workshop, the eight weeks, students you know, agreed that overall that was satisfactory or very good or excellent. So before I go to some of the key lessons learned and recommendations I have for other programs, are there any questions at this stage? Nicole, this has been really, really great so far. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and so I want to make sure we have enough time for you to finish up um, your presentation. Um, maybe we can just get a couple of them in here. Um, Kenan Salonero asked, um, how general do you find these views with those you interact with? And this was kind of directed more towards the first part of your um, presentation. Um, <clears throat> what is meant by these views? Karen, do you mind expounding? No, I don't mind at all. Um, Nicole, this has been great. And I'll just fess up that I'm coming from a bit of a glass is half empty mode right now. <laughs> but what you're talking about um, within my own work, we've been working on creating a, a completely different mindset of how we do science. And that half empty part comes because I have been um, a reviewer for several years on some of the new kinds of graduate education, I've been noticing an erosion of, of um, daring, of swinging out, of, I've been noticing it's been getting more and more conservative. And so what, when I'm talking about on these views is this fundamental um, proposition that you have that doing science differently with different people at the table from a completely different construct of collaboration and um, nurturing one another is the different view, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is, and, and hoping it exists more than I've been seeing it lately, are where are the sweet spots where there's fundamental support, nurturing and guidance for these new approaches to how science should be done, in particular financial support, because I've been finding that even the CZI and the different nonprofits and NSF and NIH are not getting it, in my view, they're not seeing where the fundamental change is needed. So where do you see that? Is that enough expounding? <laughs> I'm done expounding. <laughs> yes. Thank you. That's really wonderful. Um, I think I will say that we are a unique animal at Sysinc and that we have essentially been given millions of dollars by NSF to experiment and to create these genuine, albeit what we call buffered experiences for graduate students and for, for faculty alike, honestly. This is all external to their dissertation, to their tenure package, to these really important career milestones. It's all separate. And so if they fail, if something doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. We want them to succeed. We want them to reap all of these benefits, but because it's outside of what they must do, um, I think that they have more of that freedom to, you know, what you were saying, step outside the box or, or try something new. So um, I, I really think that there need to be more programs like ours or NSF needs to free up more money for programs like ours where it's essentially um, okay to just try new things and experiment and um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it is, we are 
unique in, in that sense of it, it's basically free reign to try something. And, um, you know, hopefully what we ask all of our teams to do is to really document if something works, you know, to, to sh document that process and share those results with the wider scientific community. And my hope is that once more of that gets into the literature or gets established as frameworks, or, um, you know, Bethany, who's, who's in the audience and I are working on this novel um, approach for assessing interdisciplinarity. Once the people who have been given free license to experiment succeed, that it enters the mainstream and then it, it can create a path for others to, to try to experiment as well. Thanks, Nicole. We had another question from um, Rachel Joff Alberton. Um, she asked, how did you recruit, recruit URM scientists as mentors? That's a great question. Uh, so we actually, Fuchsia and Varsha were both postdocs at Sysinc when we were conceptualizing this and they had come to us and told us that this was a really near and dear to their hearts. So that was kind of an easy connection there. And then we connected with Jorge Ramos of Stanford through Ecological Society of America's SEEDS program. He had actually been a former participant as an undergrad in, in that program. And so I think it's really valuable to connect with lots of minority serving institutions or, or programs that might have some of these connections, um, not only people who are underrepresented minorities themselves, but who are really passionate about helping out with these sorts of opportunities. Great, I'll, I'll give you one more. Um, and then I think there's been a few more since I've been going through this. So um, we can get those maybe at the end, but um, uh, Marianne Rosens asked um, for co-developing the rules of engagement as part of the workshop. Did you start with a template of rules of engagement or do you um, did it start with open-ended discussion? I originally asked them, um, so we tried to do some pre-meeting prep. And so we asked them to do things like introduce themselves in the Slack and what they think is a unique aspect about them. And another thing we asked them to think about are these sort of, um, you know, what do you wanna see in a collaboration or in a group effort? And so we primed them in that way, but when it came time to actually develop the participation agreement, I created, a template that sort of set out the, you know, the um, reason behind needing this, and then I, I let them fill it in. And I would be happy to to share, um, you know, a template like that if anyone's interested in seeing what that looks like. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you all. Those are really great questions. So I think. Um, I was thinking a lot about this these last few days, what I learned and what I think is feasible for other programs to do is to first reevaluate your program selection criteria. So we made a point when we were reviewing applications that we were not going to look at things like GPA or SAT scores or number of publications a student had. That just, that didn't matter to us because we knew about the biases that affect publication rates or how connections might get you into a, a better resourced lab. And we knew about things like racially biased SAT scores. So we, what we really did look for was the enthusiasm and passion students had in their um, you know, question responses to us about why they wanted to participate in this workshop and what they were hoping to get out of it. And we really used that as the basis for who we wanted to invite to participate. Another important thing is diversity, considering diversity in all respects. So we had students who may not have been people of color, but perhaps they were first generation students from rural communities who's, who had never you know, had college graduate student guidance before. Perhaps they were non-traditional students and maybe they were in their 40s as, as part of you know, being a graduate student. Uh, sexual orientation, transgender students, all kinds of student, geographic 
representation. It all matters and it all makes for a richest experience if, if all are uh, prioritized. Don't stop DEI efforts with those who are invited to participate after I just talked about who to invite. Um, a one size fits all approach will not work. Materials, approaches, content, all need to be tailored to underrepresented minority students to be relevant, to be meaningful, and to send the message to the students that this was not just a tick the box type of effort, but your organization, your program, really tried to make something that will benefit the students and that will make their graduate careers, their professional careers, um, something that's better. And so the way we did that, for example, was making sure that all of our um, you know, activities, as I mentioned before, had something to do with, with DEI. So rather than what we might've done in the past of giving, um, asking graduate students to come up with role-playing scenarios featuring the, um, you know, uh, Michelle Bennett's uh, top 10 interdisciplinary skills, we threw in things like, um, DEI challenges that might complicate those skills. So rethinking your, your activities, rethinking whose work you're featuring and who you're citing um, can all be steps to getting you there. And so with that said, don't think that you need to throw everything out that your program's already doing and start over. We looked at what we did. We looked at, you know, what about what we do is really amenable or conducive to DEI and how can we bring that in rather than how, how can we um, you know, get rid of something and, and create something new? And I know that this is something that will make offering DEI programs much more feasible if you can bring this into what it is you already do well, what you already have resources and staff for. And take a look at your program's leadership. You know, I was open earlier in this talk that John and I were very cognizant of who we are as people what we can speak to and what we can't speak to. And so we, we, we sought to fill in those gaps and expand what we could offer by bringing in the, the DEI mentors. And speaking of them, you saw from that quote from one of the graduate students that it was so important to them that the mentors mentored from a place of caring and respect first, rather than just focusing on the science or just focusing on the intellectual aspect of the workshop. Inviting participants to bring their whole selves to your program. You know, don't shy away from differences or be afraid to, to mention them. Embrace them. So we had students talking about things like, you know, um, well, as a woman or as a Black woman, I see it this way. Or as a, um, you know, first generation ecologist, I see it this way or as a, you know, someone, um, a Hispanic parent anthropologist, I would approach it this way. And so you really see this rich array of options and expertise to harness and make your science better rather than treating everyone like they're all the same. And then I know that not everyone has the luxury to do this, but I spent a long time, uh, several months, and probably several months really diving into DEI needs, issues, and best practices. I am not formally trained in this. I had to really teach myself a lot of things, learn from a lot of people. Um, I attended the SACNAS conference, which I highly recommend, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native American Scientists, I believe. Uh, they have a diversity in STEM conference that that I attended, which was really illuminating. And don't just stick to the peer reviewed literature. There's a certain, well, of course, there are valuable things in that. Um, there's a certain way that scientific writing must be done that I think limits some, some non-majority perspectives. So I did things like read a lot of blogs, watch a lot of TED Talks, um, you know, all kinds of look at Twitter. There's so much about scientists of color on Twitter and the issues they're facing and the things that are on their mind. So this vast array of resources to pull from. 
And then don't expect to go to the same old conferences or email the same old listservs and get new results. Really expand your program's recruitment horizons. So, you know, I went to that SACNAS conference. We, with the help of the SEEDS program, we emailed a bunch of listservs, minorities serving listservs I had never heard of. So if you can find a partner that can really expand um, the communities you can tap into, I would highly encourage that. And then embrace virtual technology for its DEI advantages. Even though it's not ideal, we all wanted to be together. We recognize that the virtual training may have been great for people who have disabilities. It Maybe it saved someone who's transgender the awkwardness of having to decide which bathroom to use. Maybe it helps a student who's a parent stay home for, for their child. Um, you know, it, it definitely makes it easier with the things like labeling your technological platforms with she and her or your name pronunciation. You can do that with name tags, but um, there are a lot of advantages to the virtual environment that I think we can take, it, take advantage of. And just important to remember, students as scientific trainees cannot be separated from their larger personal identities, which have been shaped by the way the world at large interacts with them. We can't expect them to just shut all of this when they walk through our, our lab doors or our department doors. And I, I think we, we shouldn't expect them to, we should really utilize this as, as a strength. And so because of, you know, oops, got one minute. <laughs> because of this workshop, um, you know, we just feel that our community is more diverse than ever before, more equipped to innovate, um, better positioned to make actionable progress on issues. And as leadership, we feel just more conscious of inclusive steps to be taken, attuned to diverse needs, aware of barriers, better equipped to respond to situations, um, and better equipped to help create a scientific world that is just and fair and representative of our wider society. So thank you to the students who participated in the workshop and to my collaborators um, and to you Interreach. And um, yes, if anyone has any other questions or wants to see in detail anything that we did, um, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, and so um, maybe what we can do is I'll capture the chat and um, send it over to Nicole. And um, if there's if there's anyone that would like a, a response via email, maybe you can include your email address in the chat right now, um, or email Nicole directly. Um, For anyone who wants or is able to stay on, I'm happy to stay past one as well, if you want to do that. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nicole. This was really, really great. Thank you all. I really enjoyed it. I'll stop sharing now.